Hello, I'm Brian with GlutenFreeHomeBrewing.com and today we're here with Walker. He's um, the one that's been making these wonderful um, bottle uh, stoppers that uh, we've been selling on our website and we're in his shop right now. We're going to be pouring some beers and doing some tastings. Uh, full disclosure, Walker does not uh, have a need to uh, drink gluten-free beer, but I know you've enjoyed quite a few of my beers. He makes and, them good. <laughs> and I always really enjoy pouring for somebody that doesn't have to drink gluten-free beer because it's been a long time since I've had conventional beer and uh, I always want to make sure or, or have an idea like how my beers compare to what you've been drinking. So I'm sure myself and uh, some viewers will be really interested in what feedback that you have. I'm looking forward to that part. Yeah. You want to talk about your stoppers that we have on our website? We have some of your equipment here in the background. And sure. These are made on, on um, a wood lathe that you see here behind you. And um, I turn the wooden part on the lathe <clears throat> and they're screwed into a stainless steel uh, food safe bottle stopper with uh, O-rings to make sure it's a good seal. And uh, they're great for, for beer or wine or olive oil or whatever you can come up with that's in a bottle. That you want to stop. <laughs> they have a couple of, there's like three seals on them so depending on like the diameter of the bottle it, it, it gets a really right. good seal so it either seals with the first one or second one or third one and even have a demonstration. <laughs> and before we started selling them on the website I know I've given a few um, as uh, personal gifts and the people that received them were very enthusiastic to receive them so um, they, obviously, they immediately identified the, the craftsmanship and the quality of them and they really enjoyed them. Handmade functional art. <laughs> <laughs> um, today we're following up with some feedback from our last video uh, tutorial, video blog. Uh, it's been a while since we've done one. A few, of a, a few of you have reached out to us and asked us to go into further detail about the uh, porter and stout uh, beers. And we took a lot of notes and I had a, I'm going to read from those notes today. So I'm going to be looking at my sheet a little bit, um, but I want to make sure that I cover certain things. Um, we really should go back to uh, the 1700s when the porter and stout beers were first introduced. And this part I'm going to read because I want to get it right. Uh, the porter was more or less a robust brown ale uh, that was very popular with London working class. Uh, the popularity of this beer quickly prompted breweries of the time to brew different porter styles, uh, including the single, the double, the triple, and the imperial stout porter. Simply put, the stout was a strong porter. Um, eventually, the word porter was gradually dropped from the name and the beers were just called stouts. Uh, even Guinness Extra Stout was called Guinness Extra Superior Porter until about 1840. So fast forwarding to today, um, there's a lot of confusion about what's a stout and what's a porter. Um, many breweries use the word stout because it's got a better market share. and. Um, they know they can sell a beer that's called stout. More often, they can sell a beer that's called porter. Uh, today's got some music in the background for our entertainment. Today's beer judge would most likely differentiate the two beers in the following way: a porter is more malty with a complex and flavorful profile, while a stout is stronger with a bold, roasted, bitter, and slightly burnt profile. Uh, there's probably been a books written about this subject, so um, please don't blow up our emails and tell us we're wrong about everything. We're covering history for the last several hundred years in about three sentences. <laughs> My kind of history class. <laughs> now we have two robust porter, I'm sorry, two porter kits. We have the robust porter, which is a beer style, um, but we marketed it that way because we were trying to be true to style. Um, we also have the Roca Creek uh, Porter Kit. Uh, that's the partial grain, partial mash uh, version of the recipe uh, kit. And we really, we could have called those stouts, but we wanted to be true to the style. We didn't want to say that they were stouts uh, because they really truly are porters. Um, but let's, let's turn our attention to the two beers that we're going to pour today. Actually, we're going to pour three. Um, the 
first two are, um, yeah, the first two are partial grain kits, meaning we conducted a full mash of the malts, and then we used sorghum syrup during the boil uh, to make up for the, the base malt that wasn't in the grain bill. Uh, we found this technique gets the best bang for the buck. You're getting all the fermentable sugars out of the malt, and you're using the sorghum syrup um, to uh, replace the, the base malt. Um, our porter was developed with kind of a graduated approach. Uh, we wanted to, we didn't want to just use dark malts to make a dark beer. We wanted to have a flavor profile that was uh, a full flavor profile. Um, so we used, when you look at our website and you look at our recipe kit for the Robust Porter and the Roca Creek Porter, you're gonna see that we used a lot of malts in there and that's because we wanted to kind of cover the full spectrum of the, the available malts and give it a really diverse uh, flavor profile. For the second beer we're gonna pour, it's, we used a prototype LME, so don't email us asking us how can you get some because I, I don't think that you can. Um, we're fortunate to get a lot of it, uh, products that never make it to the market. Uh, it was a rice syrup that was, a right malt syrup that was uh, flame reduced and due to that flame reduction, it actually kind of colored it, kind of gave some dark color to it, but it didn't really affect the flavor profile all that much. It just gave it like a nice dark color. So we used that along with some gas hog uh, rice malt to just give it the, the darkness that we were going for, but we really didn't, well, we didn't use anything else because we just want to achieve the color without <clears throat> adding other things to the flavor profile. So when we taste the two beers, I'll be interested in your feedback that I'm hoping that the first one we pour, which is our porter, should have a nice uh, full flavor profile that kind of gives your tongue and mind a lot to think about. And then the second beer should really be one dimensional because we just use that uh, LME and the gas hog to give it the color, but it should be, should look really nice and should smell really nice. And then you're gonna drink it and go, Let's go back to that first beer. Hopefully don't show my ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last beer we're gonna pour is our version 1.0 of uh, the stout recipe that we are developing. So we are working on a stout recipe kit. Um, we're, we brewed the, our first version of that. So we're gonna pour it today. Uh, we're definitely not gonna offer it as a recipe kit because we're gonna make some changes to it, but we have it, so we're gonna pour it, and we're gonna taste it, and. and and see what we think about it. And I unplugged the bandsaw, so we're being safe. Perfect. <laughs> we're, we're good. So next we'll uh, pour the beers. This is the Roca Creek Porter. Do a very even pour of that one. <laughs> I thought I was going a little generous on that first pour, but these cl these glasses are a little deceiving. <laughs> very good color and head retention for Walker. You may not uh, realize this, but for gluten-free beers, um, having what well, we were drinking earlier today at the uh, Growler place, and I don't think you may have noticed this, but there is no head on my beer. Oh, I didn't notice that. And. This has really good head retention. Yeah. It's holding up. It's not dissipating very quickly. Um, it's got some body to it. And that's actually really hard to achieve. <laughs> well, it's harder to achieve in a gluten-free beer than it is on a conventional beer. Um, so we're gonna zoom out here in a second and do a quick tasting and then move on to the second beer. Walker, this is the Roca Creek Porter kit that we sell. Um, you got the more generous pour and that head is still holding up. It's got a nice creamy uh, look to it. Um, it doesn't seem to be dissipating anytime soon. Mm -mm. And uh, why don't we give it a taste? All right. Cheers. It really just coats it the glass. Good. I know that's like a wine thing, but I mean, it just really coats the glass there. That's good. That's not gluten free. <laughs> what flavors come through to you? Like, what do you taste? 
some chocolate. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's also a clarity to it. It's, it's like got dark chocolate tones, but it's not like just overwhelming. I mean, this is drinkable. Like, it's not like you have to get out of the fork and knife, you know? Uh -huh. You can drink this on a hot day or you're not gonna a cold a winter night. You're not gonna float a nickel on it, mm -hmm. but, uh, mm. but it's still got really good body. And, and we're sitting here drinking it and the glass is still really nice and coated. I'm kind of glad I got the generous pour. <laughs> So they sit here and watch us drink this? Well, <laughs> not for too long because we're going to have to edit some. Oh, well, <laughs> enjoy. Until the next beer. Yes, cheers. <laughs> this is the second beer we're going to taste, the one made with uh, LME and Gas Hog. Oh, we got a gusher. Got a live one. <laughs> Well, it hasn't gushed like that before. Uh, <laughs> look at that head retention, though. <laughs> but look at that head! It, uh, sorry for getting beer all over your uh, uh, wood turning equipment. That's <laughs> oh, no problem. <laughs> and your chair. It's a but, blessing. Uh, this, is, this is actually the last bottle of this particular beer that we have. Um, it was just an experimental thing, and that, that head actually is not going anywhere. Um, it's some of that foam is turning into some beer and in a few seconds we can actually taste it. But I'll be <laughs> interested in hearing your uh, feedback on this one since we still kind of have the last beer coating our tongue. And um, that first taste that you have uh, will probably be very telling as far as comparing the two beers. So we'll give that a second to uh, dissipate and then we can do our tasting. Well, this is the second beer that we poured, um, the Gusher, that you saw just a moment ago. And um, this beer is a little bit older, so that might account for why it gushed, or um, they also got knocked around a little bit, or they're just Gushers. Sometimes that happens, so we're just going to roll with it. And let's give that a taste, and I still have a little bit of, of coating on my tongue from that last beer. Yep, that's still there. Um, and <clears throat> so let's see what we think of this one, all right? So it has a nice aroma. Mm -hmm. It's dark. It's very dark. But I think you're going to notice something when you... Can't see yes, through it. It's definitely dark. <laughs> and I think you're going to notice something when you drink it. Mm. <laughs> Did it foam up in your <laughs> mouth? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, it's good, but it's more one-dimensional yeah. than the last beer. Yeah, this, this one we kind of just wanted to, we brewed this on purpose, knowing, well, theorizing and then proving to ourselves, I guess, that it's very one-dimensional. Mm -hmm. um, color isn't everything. Um, in gluten-free brewing, this may be new to you since you don't have to drink gluten-free beer. Um, but dark beers are, are really sought after. And for somebody that went from con drinking conventional beer to drinking gluten-free beer, finding um, dark beers has been really challenging oh, for bet. a lot of us. And um, you know, like when you're new to gluten-free brewing, uh, oftentimes you go for the IPA because the, like we were talking about earlier when we had a few, had a few drinks after mountain biking, uh, the IPAs kind of cover up a lot of uh, off flavors or um, undesirable flavors in um, some of the earlier gluten-free beers. Um, and in this case, just adding malt to make it dark didn't necessarily achieve the beer style. <laughs> it looks nice. Um, it does. It smells pretty good, but it just is very one-dimensional. Just it. it has that initial flavor and then it just kind of yeah. turns into nothingness. If, if we had tasted this first, I would say that's really good, but it's not as good as the first one. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I just get, I get that initial flavor and then it just, it's kind of actually really refreshing because no. it just kind of turns into 
water. I think, I think or, I'm thirsty, or, and it's yeah, it's <laughs> it makes it kind of good. It just it's very lacking. Mm -hmm. So then, I mean, if you wanted to make a beer like this, I mean, I know you can't get the LME that that we use for this, um, but it would be nothing different than using sorghum syrup or brown rice syrup um, and gas hog or some dark malt. Um, which I caution people about when they are trying to make their first dark beers that they're like, oh, just throw in a bunch of dark malt and get achieve the color. We certainly achieved the color here, um, but we didn't achieve the flavor profile that we wanted. Uh, maybe you don't want to go as, um, use such a wide range of malts that we did with our robust porter and our, our Roca Creek porter, um, because that's a, ha, that touches on a lot of different malts. Um, but you do need to have some complexity to the grain bill, otherwise you're going to end up with this very dark, attractive looking, one-dimensional beer. It's true. It's one-dimensional. And thirst quenching. And thirst quenching because... <laughs> and I was thinking, just... you definitely don't want to use hog gas. Don't get that mixed up. <laughs> no, no, no hog gas. No. <laughs> I'm not sure what that is. Hog gas? Pig parts? You know? Oh, no, no. no not good. Let's not go no. there. Mm. All right. <laughs> this is the last beer we're going to pour today. It is our first version of a stout recipe kit that we're working on. Uh, I'm going to give a quick shout out to our friend Trevor, who's a customer and friend of ours that brewed this on our behalf since uh, we couldn't find time to brew. So thank you, Trevor. All right, so here is the uh, stout we just poured. This is our first version of this recipe. Um, we're making changes to it and we're gonna brew it again. Um, but let's give this one a taste. Cheers. Cheers. Ooh. Mm. So I definitely get that roasty sort of yeah. uh, aroma. Definitely the flavor. Not a porter. Um, not a porter. Mm. It has a slightly burnt taste that's um, consistent with the style, but it's not overly. Doesn't burnt. hurt you. Yeah, it doesn't hurt you. Mm. Um, kind of tastes like coffee, and there's no coffee in it. Mm. It's not overly sweet or anything. Mm -mm. Mm. I keep forgetting it's gluten free. It's, um, I like that. You want to say that again in a little louder? I said I keep forgetting it's gluten free. <laughs> Honestly, did just for a second. It's, um, <laughs> that's why we're here, so I remember. <laughs> it could be a little bit darker. It has kind of a reddish hue to it, which, um, you wouldn't notice if it was a little bit darker. Mm -hmm. It's got kind of a nice caramel color to it. Clean aroma. And it's definitely, it's not as, it's not coating the glass like the, the first, and right. apparently even the second pour, which is a gusher. <laughs> um, a few things. <laughs> but, it, but it does have a decent mouthy feel to it. Mm -hmm. It does. And I don't know if that's just residual from some of the previous beers, but I, I, don't, I don't think it is. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of, it stays and kind of lingers. I think the last beer was a good palate cleanser, you know? So this is, this that, is a, a fair taste. Would be a good description of it. Mm -hmm. So not bad for our first version. No. Um, and I drink this. The difference between the first and the third, as far as beer styles, um, the flavor profile definitely shifted. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm getting much more of the, you know, typical. Um, stout flavors from from this beer as opposed Burkiness to the, and, yeah yeah and it's, it seems like almost like drier mm -hmm. or uh, less mouth coaty mm -hmm. yeah <clears throat> but yummy well i think that's going to do it for this episode um any last plugs as far as your uh, stoppers you want to put out there 
Oh uh, well, I could I could just show you real quick. This is an unfinished piece, which and looks very different than the finished pieces. Yes, and uh, if you take a this is the the metal part, the stainless steel part, and it's actually I thread the wood, and they just screw together. I think you put a little dab of glue in there so it doesn't come apart yeah, or something. Yeah, I do. Then you can kind of get an idea how it's how it's made that way. So kind of interesting. And when you finish it and and use the stain, is it going to be lighter in color as opposed It'll to these be darker a, ones a bit here? Darker, actually. Um, this is a maple. These are all redwood, so they are naturally darker, but. Okay. Um, yeah, I hit them with olive oil and then a um, uh, high polish finish. While it's on the lathe, spinning at about 1500 RPMs. And no, no two are exactly alike, because um, they're all kind of handcrafted and uh, I'm assuming you have to work with what you have yeah. in front of you. So yeah. even if you wanted to make them the same, which would be no fun at all, you kind of work with the piece of wood that you're, you you're working with in hand. You look at a piece of wood and you kind of try to uncover the prettiest parts of it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your feedback and drinking some beer with me for the second time today. Yeah. And uh, cheers. Cheers. <laughs>